Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Austin B Media. I'm here with the filmmaking team behind Bliss, which is premiering at Sundance Friday, January 19th at 4.15. And then it has a second screening Thursday, January 25th at 12 p.m., both at the headquarters, right? At the Yarrow. But welcome. Thanks so much for taking uh, your early morning to uh, talk with me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm on the East Coast, Austin, so it's, okay. it's midday for me. <laughs> okay. Easy. Yeah. I've been keeping an eye on that because a letterbox said they'd be posting their year in review mid-morning, and I'm like, <laughs> come on, it's, it's noon in New York. But jokes aside, I, I am really waiting for that. But how would... Uh, you describe Bliss, because I know I could just read all off the log line. But yeah, how would you all describe Bliss? I think I, it's a... Yeah, Clint, go ahead. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I've been failing at describing it all morning, so... <laughs> you have. I'll just lead off and say, I think it's a story of redemption. Oh, can I tell world. you what the story is about? Real quick. Huh? About a drug addict guy and his girlfriend. and the, And he buries the body. But he's an ex-con, so he's afraid that if he has this dead body, he's going to get in trouble. So he buries it in the desert. And then his girlfriend's sister shows up and says, where's my sister? And then drama ensues. I think that's a great way of describing it. Yeah, fair. I love that. Yeah, I think that's a great way of describing it. And also some backstory, I believe... This is a sequel to Virgil Bliss from 20 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah, it picks the story up 20 years, I guess a little over 20 years after we leave Virgil Bliss, the, the titular character, in a Brooklyn apartment where he's just basically undone all of the good things he's been trying to do, like to live a straight life, not committing crime, not doing drugs and drinking and being violent. And he does all of those in one day. And we leave him his first drink. We pick up the story on the other side of the country. But he's a fugitive living off the grid in the desert canyons north of LA. We wrote the screenplay together and we really had to try and imagine what the backstory, what has ensued over the course of these two decades that has led him to this place. Is there anything yeah. you can? Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with Joe. That's where we have picked it up 20 years, which in this case is interesting be to me because this not only does the story occur 20 years later, but it's the same people 20 years later. So it, we are literally making it 20 years later with the same person. Yeah, but I guess in that sense, did you have to go to any kind of inspiration, look at any old movies to think about what happened to these 20 years? or? What did you, how did you fill in the blanks of what happened between the Virgil Bliss and Bliss? We talked well, a lot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. We did. Farrell and I, I had met working with her earlier and also on her project. I started to talk to Joe. I said, met this really brilliant artist and we really should work together in some capacity because she's our people. I think the pandemic, we were starting to, have to wear a mask and not go outside and go on Zoom all the time. We were very isolated. And there was this feeling that we were going to die. We weren't getting any younger. And and the pandemic really reinforced the whole idea of mortality and, and, and doing something uh, that, that brought us joy, which was something we did when we were young without really thinking about it. Joe and I started to talk and the idea of a sequel, where is Virgil now? What he, has he done? That started to kind of Form. And then Farrell came on board. We all instantly bonded and started working on the story through very long conversation. Over time, to develop things through a process of time, allowing us to imagine what may have happened to Virgil in those years, and then who he meets and where we, we find him now and what is his story at this point. So that's how it came into being. Yeah, and I guess describe your role. I know we just briefly talked about it. Like, how did, what did you make into the movie? Like, how did your other projects and for Bliss? Yeah, I'd, I'd just love to hear from you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would say that after working the second time with Clint on a short film that I made, 
I loved collaborating with him so much. I love rehearsing with him and I love just talking to him about story. And so when he started talking about Joe and this film that they had made and their whole artistic collaboration, it seemed like such a no brainer that we would all work together. And dare I say, we're a dream team. And it was really fun. Just working with Clint originally just made me so hungry to keep working uh, together. And we will continue to. It's so fun. It's such a joy to to work with both of them. Can I jump in, Austin? And, and something that just popped into my head that I had completely forgotten about when you asked Farrell what she had maybe brought to the process. And I just remembered, Farrell, very early on, you had asked me if I'd seen this movie, Silent Light. Oh, um, I love it. And, oh, that's right. And I forget the director's yeah. name. But it's based on a Miriam Toes story, I think. And it's about this sort of Amish community. It's in South Me America. The yeah. Mennonite community in Mexico. But there was a, a story point there, you know, where this character dies and then comes back to life. And I remember that became a very important theme for me. And I think in our story, I had envisioned that Dwayne, a.k.a. Virgil, would bury... Amy, and then they would dig her out. She would somehow come back. Well, that's why Joe is oh, Amy yeah. Yeah. in a way. But anyway, so that was a very important, that led to the whole burial storyline. And then, of course, that evolved and we took it in a completely different direction than what was inside. <clears> right. But I had forgotten about that completely. And Austin, you, I don't know, something you said just triggered that. But it was that kind of a process, right? Where we would say, hey, watch this movie, or I read this thing. Do you remember that Carver story? Or And it was a lot of talking and sharing movies and ideas. And eventually the story just evolved and evolved. And it changed even once I got out to LA and we started looking for locations, it changed. We had to change the hero location, the place where, you know, where Dwayne and, and Amy are living the location was not really the kind of location we wanted. So we had to change the story so that it worked for this location. They weren't quite as down and dirty as, as we had maybe initially. They weren't living on the floor out in the desert. They were they were people who had maybe normal, or at least Amy had had pretty normal life that sort of went off the rails and then and then she meets Dwayne and they're just getting by and which I and I like that story better. So it, it was this constant evolution and constant talking and sharing of ideas and inspirations. So it's really how it came about. Yeah, I thank you for interjecting. I'll make sure to put what was it, silent light and silent light really mannered. It's very quiet. And I guess you could say bliss is all of those things but i believe they do a sunrise and a sunset in real time like they film a yeah. real sunset they film a yeah. real sunrise and the whole movie is this oh my gosh and it's about endurance and then at the very end is just a piece of magic the whole movie is super raw real life and then at the very end is this magical moment that's totally fantastical and it, it yeah. it's so good it's the director is carlos regales and he did a film before this that was bong. I, I can't remember the name of it, but like really also very intense. Anyway, we're not talking about Carlos Regatis. We're talking about <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we can, but. <laughs> and are we sure Farrell didn't direct this Silent Light and she just came <laughs> back and oh was my like, God. I <laughs> wish. And honey, I will. But my <laughs> style, I'm a little bit more. I have ADHD and my films are very, I think, faster. And I. As much as I want to film a sunset in real time, that's just, actually, I did write that into a screenplay, but no, I'm different. I'm also ADHD, so check out Rainbow Bridge. I also Bridge. did an interview of that, a very ADHD-driven short. That's like 15, 13 minutes, something like that. It's real short, and it falls to the wall crazy. Oh my uh, gosh, I can't <laughs> wait to see it. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, like. We probably spent like half the interview talking about DVD menus. <laughs> and I'm not kidding either. Yeah, it's um, dangerous. It, it is dangerous because I got off on a tangent about like Buzz Lightyear and Lilo and Stitch, how their DVD menus were great. And they have like a pet in there that does a d dance routine. And I'm like, oh, you should make that like a screensaver for the physical release. 
<laughs> just like almost like the DVD a screensaver. Right. Uh, but getting back on topic, something that interested me when I was looking at the press release is there was a specific term, incidental cinema, that was used in the press release, which I thought was interesting. So, first of all, which one of you coined that phrase? And how would you describe that philosophy? And then, but offshoot, it is like a three-parter, I apologize. <laughs> like, maybe we can veer off into artistic expression. A lot, most anticipated 2024 lists are coming out. And I feel like it's a lot of franchise stuff and not a lot of indie movies that are being on, the, that are on those lists. Whichever of those three questions you want to answer, go ahead, anyone. <laughs> I'll, I'll get started. It, so incidental cinema, the idea uh, behind it, it was either going to be called incidental films or punk films, like the idea of the same ethos behind punk, the idea of not getting hung up on maybe the trappings of what a mainstream film would look like and just going out taking what you have and going out and doing it. And at the time, this was in 2006, <clears throat> and it was like a revolution in filmmaking technology. We made Virgil Bliss, the prequel to Bliss. That was the first phase of that, where you could make a film on mini DV and it could go to a festival and it could go into theater. That was unheard of before, just a year or two before that. In 2006, the technology it was advancing, like it was such a steep incline. Like when HD came around, you could buy yourself a camera that looked as good as anything being made in Hollywood. It occurred to me, though, that people were taking that technology and the filmmakers that I knew and, 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 and respected, they were still telling the stories that might get them to Hollywood might be a, a stepping stone. They weren't just telling the story they wanted to tell or being bold or taking a chance. And I had come across this great book um, that was edited by Godfrey Cheshire, the, the film critic, called Lessons with Karastami. And it was just, it's just musings on film and teachings by uh, the Iranian filmmaker Abbas Karastami. And he had this line where he said, we need to be making films are like, like scraps of paper that if we don't really like how it turns out, you just tear it up and throw it away and you, and you, and you do another one. And I love that idea. And I wanted to run with that. I wanted to run with that idea. I know really great actors. I know really great cinematographers. And we can just get, we have the technology. What are we waiting for? Why are we waiting for someone to give us permission to tell the story we want to tell? So that's the whole sort of ethos behind incidental films. And then there was a second part, Austin, that I feel like I didn't get to. Yeah, I guess the second part that kind of branches off of that is a lot of most anticipated lists were coming out for the year. And I keep reading all of these and indie movies don't pop up on those. Yeah. And I don't use indie as a derogatory. I just mean it was all like franchise features. Yeah. And I was just like, can't we indies on the most anticipated? <laughs> so my question was like, basically, we're in the throes of award season and things like that, where things aren't really being viewed on artistic merit but rather their awards chances so i guess my question is do you think audiences are receptive and this is a heady one to films made purely for artistic expression without considering commercial stuff like hey is this going to start a franchise is this going to be the next marvel movie or anything like that and nothing against marvel movies yeah I I don't want to get mm -hmm. flamed on the internet. <laughs> I think people watch movies for different reasons sometimes. People can escape in Marvel movies, and it's like going to an amusement park. Some director has already compared it to that and been mm -hmm. flamed already. But for me, I go to movies because I love the story, and I love stories mm -hmm. of human beings and human beings in conflict. Ultimately, I think that when we become lost in a movie, we become the character. And we're with the character in their journey, trying to figure out how to get out of this problem. 
just like the main character is. Consequently, we're able to, not to be too heady about this, but I think we're able to have some catharsis. The main character may die in the end, or something horrible happens to them, or something wonderful. In any case, we can stand up when the lights come on and stretch and go back into our life and having felt vindicated. As an actor who worked a lot on stage, I think in the theater where I storytelling be began in, in the forum, religion and storytelling were one and the same. We depended on these stories being told because they were telling our stories as the audience member. And in Greece, they would kill the actor if he wasn't very good, which might be still <laughs> a good idea. I don't know. <laughs> you know but but I, I, I do feel that indie, so speaking to indie, when we say indie, I, I think a beautiful story well told is going to stand up just like a beautiful song played when Kurt Cobain came along and started to sing his song, you could play it on an acoustic guitar. You didn't have to have uh, a foreigner kind of uh, production budget for his music. In fact, it just worked and it was compelling to us. And I think that if we take the label off in the big budget, movies that are compelling to us are ones that we are drawn to as human beings, uh, I think, uh, organically. I feel like this idea and I don't mean to be pretentious here, but I'm trying to 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 give the right, to quote the right person. I think it was Aristotle. You cannot rub up against soot and expect to come away without the benefit of a little soot. And I think right now people, I just, I, I get on the subway and everyone's on there looking at their phones and they're watching and they're looking at TikTok and YouTube shorts and all these things. And I just think that's where people are right now. I don't sit around worrying about it, but in, in moments of contemplation, I wonder if maybe as a civilization, we're moving away from this form, this hour and a half to two hour form of storytelling where you know people no longer have the desire for that kind of story. They, if, if, if all you're watching are 20 to 30 second clips of something or TV shows that are essentially filler leading to cliffhanger, like that becomes, that's how your brain works. Those are the kinds of stories that you are drawn to. And so when you get hit with a two hour film that has that classic, that arc, that isn't the quick, like all these cliffhangers, maybe we lose the appetite for that. So I don't know if that, that's, I feel like that's a kind of a downer I, I observation. Think yeah, I think that's, <laughs> maybe that's true, but that's super cynical. I think Films are human. There's something that, and maybe not everybody can sit through a two hour movie, but that feels so, there will always be people that fall into story and are attracted to story, whether it's Marvel story or the holdovers. People will always want to go see a movie. We just are, for all time, human beings need story to understand themselves. And mm. TikTok isn't, showing us ourselves maybe in that way there's always room for cinema <laughs> Carol Amadeus yeah, it's always the like <laughs> what are your four favorite films but yeah it's just interesting and I recommend Slam Dance. It's really cheap. It's probably one of the cheapest festivals out there I think it's under ten dollars to get access to the entire festival whereas Tribeca I think I paid like 150 for a virtual pass or something oh like that. Oh my God. Yeah. I ran out of the press library time. So I was like, oh, I'll just <laughs> get the at home pass so I can have the extra like week or two of movies and shorts and some TV shows I think were on there. But I recommend people at least check out Slam Dance 2024, even if you just go to the shorts. Everything, I think, almost everything is on that Slam Dance channel. They've even got an Apple TV app if you've got one of those. They've got apps. I, I'm, sh I'm sure they have an app for every device. It's real easy to set up. And I recommend people go check out Bliss at Slam Dance because speaking of the Slam Dance channel, you can watch this online beginning January 22nd. And I believe it will last through the 25th. So if you don't, if you don't have the budget to go to park city you can just watch it from home pop some popcorn if, if that's your snack of choice i know mine is gummy bears but like the good kind what's your favorite color gummy bear Ooh, 
Favorite flavor? The red ones. Those are the best because they stay freshest the longest. Because <laughs> if you go to a movie theater, they just leave them out. And then they're all like stale. But yeah, I have a regular supply of gummy bears in the pantry behind me. <laughs> Austin, can I interject one thing? Just in also online at Slamdance and their channel and for the festival will be Virgil Bliss, which was the 2001 film will nice. be showing. And then I believe Bliss will be up starting on the 22nd as well. So you could do a double feature. You could see Clint Jordan, 23 years younger. I had to watch it to do some subtitling. And I think you look better. You've aged. You you look better now than you did back then. For sure. Well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's a double feature then. Yeah. A lot um, of gummy bears. Yeah, that's just a... I got to go to Bucky's, get like a whole pound of gummy bears. <laughs> but here's my thing. Bucky's doesn't have gummy worms. Um, you have all these gummy bears, but no gummy worms. I don't understand it. Are you a gummy worm type of person? Occasionally. If I need to break it up, if I'm getting tired of gummy bears, I, I either have to go to gummy worms or Butterfinger Bites or Dots. Um, do you do, have you ever done something called hot tamales? I have. That's my it, favorite. They don't stock hot tamales. It's, it's a rare candy. Honestly. Yes, so. Mike and Ike's by the makers of hot tamales. I don't like Mike and Ike's because of the flavor, but hot tamales, the cinnamon flavor. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, I'll have to go on eBay, buy they have a them at pallet. They have them at Target. There you go. Uh, hard to find. You can't go to Walmart. You go across the street, go to Target. <laughs> literally for me it's literally right across the street but yeah you can catch virgil bliss and bliss the week of the 22nd i believe yeah as virgil bliss the 22nd i'm not sure when that goes up but it will okay. yes definitely the festival it will be on by i would say the 19th it will be up. okay so catch it back to back if you're watching it on the 22nd watch virgil bliss first and then watch bliss just back to back yes. you got a double feature right there but yeah and Obviously, check out a bunch of other slam dance stuff. No, I'm sorry. No, no those were Sundance. Those are Sundance. I'm getting mixed up. But yeah, so go across the street for those. Um, but yeah, go check it out. I'll have links to both in person and online tickets in the description of the YouTube link, uh, the podcast link, and the website link. Because you, these days, you got to post things three times to get eyes on things. But I want to thank all of you for coming on. Uh, apologies if I didn't ask all the questions. I've literally got a list of 15 here. If I, if I asked all of them, we would be on here for an hour or 15. But with that said, I hope everyone checks out Bliss at Slam Dance. If you don't, at least check out my review um, coming on the 22nd. So check it out. Um, and until next time. <laughs>